are a nonprofit or a nonprofit arts organization in Colorado Springs. Basically, um, we uh, do two programs. One is a lecture series where we've brought in big name authors. And the other is a fellowship program with low income high schools. Um, it is a writing fellowship where kids who participate get English course credit and college scholarships. And so um, we run that out of our office that you see behind us. Sophia actually runs that. She's our educational liaison. Um, and uh, I'm kind of the founder of and the detail work of the project. So that's briefly Converge. I know Peter probably like four years ago now when Converge was just, just starting, you went into Poor Richard's bookstore and signed a few books and I know they were schlepping the project to you at that time. Now we're a little more on our feet and kind of have some things figured out. So that's kind of briefly what we do. And, and then we also have Emily Sullivan here. She's a friend of the project. Also, she's a painter. And I have some interest maybe a little later in the interview in talking about Peter, your work and Emily's work in a bit of conversation. Yeah. Emily um, is a painter of, uh, in my experience of her work of skyscapes. And um, I'm kind of interested uh, talking a little down the line about you're writing about sky and Emily's painting about sky and kind of um, thinking through or asking about sky as this kind of language of, I guess like possibility and also terror. I experienced that in both of your work. So, mm -hmm. um, so, so I'll get to those questions, but um, that's kind of a brief introduction. And, Sophia, if you want to introduce yourself and then Emily and we can get started. Yeah, sure. sure. Um, so I've been working with Converge just newly as of this year, um, taking over the high school fellowship program here. Um, yeah, that's, I don't know. <laughs> it's just been really- You guys, do, are the fellowships all over the country or just in Colorado? Just in Colorado. Cool, all right. Yeah. Cool. And I'm Emily Sullivan. Um, I'm a big fan of your work. So I'm really, really honored and excited to be here. Um, I read Dog Stars in July, so mid-pandemic pandemic book. It was really interesting timing to read it, and I'm almost done with The Painter, and I also read The Ripper, and just really love them all. Um, I got my MFA in painting from CSU and then moved my husband's in the Army, and so then moved down here to Colorado Springs, and I've been um, painting here ever since. And yeah, like Sam said, my work is... Um, primarily skyscapes, um, but also some landscapes, but very interested in place in general. Um, and I'm very interested in how your books talk about place and specifically um, the Colorado landscape. You know, you have some really just beautiful imagery and um, scene setting and how you talk about Colorado. So yeah, I'm really awesome. excited to be cool. here. Yay. All right, well, fun. Yeah, Peter, we know you, so I think we can kind of, Jump in, or at least we know you through your work. I'd I'd love to maybe start with the question about just writing process or the logistics of writing. How does that happen for you? So, um, let's see. Well, there's two things. I um I came up as a poet, and uh, my dad read poetry to me ever since I was you know the tiniest kid. Every night before I went to sleep, and he had me on. Um, you might have heard me say it before, but he had me on E.E. E. Cummings when I was like six. Um, I didn't understand the poems, thank goodness, because some of them are pretty racy. <laughs> but I do remember, you know, Buffalo Bill's defunct who used to ride a silver water smooth stallion. And, uh, and I just loved um, the music of poetry and I just wanted to do that. So I sort of came up writing poetry as a very young guy. Um, and then I got out of school and, and um, I found out that I couldn't make a living as a poet, which they, you know, they should have told us maybe. <laughs> it's kind of mean of them. Uh, so I started writing for magazines and I tried to bring as much of my love of cadence and, you know, lyricism into the articles that I was writing. And um, Sense of Place was, you know, was a huge... I found that I was most happy when I was setting um, scene, setting scene and, and writing about place and nature because that's where, you know, I thought, you know, if I can travel in my imagination, even in um, nonfiction, let's just go someplace that I love. 
and uh, really uh, transport myself and my reader there. So I really worked on that, um, writing out, you know, for Outside Magazine and, and Adventure and Men's Journal. Um, I did a lot of expedition writing and stuff, but really what I was really doing was just um, sneakily um, being a poet who loved wild places <laughs> and trying to make a living. Um, and then when I finally had saved up enough money, um, I thought I was writing for Business Week at the time. I'd followed one editor through all these magazines to Business Week. And he said, I want you to write for me. And I said, yeah, but business, I mean, I, I don't even balance my checkbook. And he said, well, look, as long as you can put a pie chart somewhere in the story, um, you're good. And it's amazing what you, where you can put a pie chart with some. <laughs> <laughs> so I wrote about you know, fracking coming to Western Colorado. I wrote about uh, uh, a rhetorician that I just uh, love who could sort of convince anybody of anything. Um, stories like that. And I'd saved up enough money and I thought, you know, it's time to write the novel that I've always wanted to write. And I went to my coffee shop in my little neighborhood in Denver and I sat down and I, and I thought, you know, I'd read all these books about writing novels or a couple of them, like John Gardner's book on writing novels um, and Stephen King. And, you know, there were proponents of writing uh, outlines and plot. And I just thought, you know, I've written so much nonfiction that uh, I, I always knew what was going to happen next and I always knew the ending and I don't want to know. I, I, you know, I'm really interested in the sound of language, as I said, but I'm also like a lifelong kayaker and river runner. And what I love about being on a river is that you, if you're on a river that's never been described or you've never done it or heard about it, you come around a bend and a tight bend in a gorge or whatever, and you don't know what's gonna be there. It could be a waterfall or a cougar drinking or just a flight of mayflies or swallows. And I wanted that feeling of travel into wild terrain that I'd never, you know, that I'd never been in. And I thought, you know, I mean, if I could, if I wrote a detailed outline, I might as well just be a lawyer, you know? <laughs> so, um, so I sat down and I just said, don't think, don't think, just listen. And I started writing the first line in the, the dog stars was something like, um, I keep the beast running. I keep the low lead on tap. I foresee attacks. A few lines later, my name is Hig, Big Hig if you need another. If I ever woke up crying in the middle of a dream, and I'm not saying I did, it's because the trout are gone, every one. And as soon as I heard that, I, I just thought, okay, I'm listening, speak. And then it was as if this guy was on the other side of a campfire on an October night, you know, with the wind blowing the flames around and just telling me what had happened to him a few years before. And I was just, I would just show up and I would just, you know, just say, listen, listen, don't think. And it was the most thrilling thing I'd ever experienced. And I kind of wrote that book in a white heat. And uh, I decided, you know, I also have a method where I write a thousand words a day and I write every day of the week because I heard that Graham Greene did that. So the nuts and bolts of the writing, you know, that's sort of my, my approach, my emotional approach to the writing is just to try and show up and get out of the way. But the, but the technical sort of nuts and bolts of it is that, you know, I write a thousand words a day. I don't write less and I go just past a thousand until I'm in the middle of a scene and I stop. I don't ever write through a scene or let myself, you know, run on to 2,000 or 3,000 words, even when I'm really excited, because then I'm ending at a transition and it's white space, it's a double return. And if you come back to white space every day, you might as well start the book. You know, you have that emotional inertia. You've got to, you've got to get the rock rolling up the hill again. So I really believe in that thing of stopping in the middle. And, I, and I, I'm very disciplined. I mean, I write every day of the week. You know, I heard Graham Greene did that. And I kind of follow that and I stop in the middle. You have um, like a place or kind of structure where that happens. I'm interested in this when, we, largely because when we brought in um, we brought in Anthony Doerr right before the pandemic, and he was telling us he writes uh, uh, for four hours a day in a windowless room with chainsaw headphones on, and, <laughs> he, has, and he has this app on his on all this stuff called freedom that locks him out of everything but a word document. And 
kind of everything that I've just been thinking about the pragmatics of writing or that ritual space and getting into the like tangible of it. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's, you know, I approach it, uh, you sort of like a furniture maker. I mean, I really believe it's a craft. And I think you really have, for me, I have to be humble in the face of my craft. You know, I'm not sitting around uh, waiting for inspiration. I'll tell you a funny story about the French who have a different mythology about authors, but, um, but I sort of like, I go in and, you know, when it's not a pandemic, I'm at a coffee shop. I have certain a couple of tables that I like. <laughs> They're like power spots. And if I can't get them, I'm very possessive. I kind of eye the person. I give, I give them snake eyes for half an hour until, until they leave. <laughs> that one chair by the window is really good. And um, I put on headphones and I listen to rain. I listen to, uh, it's rain on a, uh, like a North Carolina roof in the mountains. Um, and so I shut out everything that way. Um, yeah, I sort of feel like, you know, I show up every day, the thousand words is kind of like, you know, I cut the wood, you know, I, I make the joints, you know, I, I assemble and, and I don't try and get into this thing of like, I'm this, you know, you know, in, artists waiting for inspiration or trying to channel the divine. I just pray that that happens. And, you know, I think of it a lot of times like, um, you know, a, a pro basketball player, one of the greats, and you watch them, you know, driving down the court in, in flow, in the zone. And you know that they do that. And they're not thinking about everything. They're passing, taking passes, driving, laying up, and they're, they're doing it all in this remarkable sort of fluid, fluent, um, beautiful dance and and the only and they're not thinking about it you know that and the only reason that they can do that and I tell this to kids all the time that I'm you know if I'm ever speaking to, to writers coming up it, the only reason they can do that is because they've taken a million shots from all over the court and they've done you know practice a million layups and pat done passing drills for you know months and months and months and months and months and you know, once you do that, you know, I wrote hundreds and hundreds of magazine stories and, and short stories and poems and, and, you know, and so once you get that foundation of craft, then, you know, if you're really lucky and you really put in the time, you can let it all go and, you know, get in that flow. And so, so yeah, I, I really approach it like, a, in some ways, like an Olympic sport. And the other part of it is that I arrange the rest of my life, I eat well, I try and get a good sleep, I get a good workout, I try and get outside, you know, every day. But I do it all because in some ways so that I can bring the best of myself to those few hours in the morning. And for me, it's not a time quota because my giornata is, you know, the thousand words. So sometimes if I'm on fire, it could take an hour and a quarter, you know, and, and sometimes it takes three and a half hours. But you know, again, that discipline of stopping when I'm just past a thousand and you gather so much momentum that way. And I always, I joke, you know, when I'm speaking um, that, you know, if you're, if you're not that smart, go for speed. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't, you know, I don't edit as I go along, you know, I just really keep it, keep it moving. And I have heard in these interviews and even this one where you kind of touch base on on starting as a poet and I just uh I experienced that as a reader of your work it has a poetic quality to it um where if I was reading your any of the books of yours out loud I there would be a pleasure to it in my mouth and I wonder if you think about that when you're writing the way that that you're sentences, paragraphs, words sound, not just the way they're kind of taken in through a reading quality. Thanks for that question and for that perception because because that's all about, I mean, that is my method. I mean, you know, I, I, I write by through my ear and, um, and I start with the first line that I just, that I love, you know, um, I think you know, Celine started with something like, my name is Amana Ambrosio in Tupi Warani. It means night rain. And I just like the sound of that. And that led into the story. You know, I just, I had no idea who was talking. And that led into the story of a young woman 
And that young woman needed to contact an investigator. That investigator turned out to be modeled on my mom. <laughs> and, you know, and I, and I wrote this book, you know, sort of galloped along, but it started with the sound of a first line that I just, that I just loved. And all my books are like that. So there's always the sound. And, um, you know, I know a lot of writers do plot and power to them. Um, but I have a sort of a reverse where I follow the music and the language into the story. And the interesting thing about that is that if you have faith in the process, mm. the language and the music of it carries me into what I pretty quickly realize is what's on my heart or what really concerns me or what I'm really thinking about, have been thinking about deeply. So it's just sort of starting the motor. And, you know, and, and as I go into it on the, by the first or second page, I sort of bump into what I'm really, really, really concerned with as an artist and a writer. It's interesting. Yeah. I will say as a reader, I have experienced that almost sensually, like the, the, the river starts with, um, uh, the, with the line that reads something like, um, they, they could smell the fire for two days or, and I, I am just kind of in this mental space immediately that takes me into my body. And I'm just, I'm thankful for that play as I take on a text where my body is playing with kind of this mouth space, but also I can smell the fire too. And I'm just there with you. Yeah, that's interesting too, because that's another thing I think about a lot. I mean, so all the books are sort of written to be read aloud. So, so, you know, you're right about that. And, um, you know, I just loved, you know, as I was coming up reading things like the Odyssey because I knew that they were oral, you know, they were, uh, you know, they were, they were only passed on in the beginning um, by someone, you know, in, you know, <laughs> um, speaking them. And, 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 so uh, I really believe in that. I also understand that we trust our bodies more than our mind, the reader does. Mm -hmm. And so I try and engage all the senses, as many as I can right away. And, and, and it comes back to what you were saying, Emily, about sense of place, you know. Um, even when I was writing, you know, um, the most gritty uh, non nonfiction, I understood that I could, I could bring the reader into the story um, with uh, full interest and commitment if I if I establish a sense of place that they trusted and that they you know could actually be transported to and I understood that I could do that by using the senses um, you know and so I try and engage as many senses as possible you know right away <laughs> there's only five of them so it's not too hard. <laughs> Well, this may be a good time to maybe switch into you and Emily's work is I'm, I'm very interested. I haven't fleshed out this until this morning. I had been kind of getting some of Emily's work for our office and I just something about the skyscapes were speaking to me. I think part of it um, is that um, I had a season of my life where I was really into like ultra marathon running and getting in the mountains of Leadville as much as possible. And there are times where I, my whole being would feel like the sky itself was a kind of mercy. You know, it could be so relentless out there on those trails, or it could be a, a softness. Either, it just depends on the day. And so I was running into Emily's work, kind of feeling like, whoa, this is art articulating that to me. Um, that sky can be ruthless. It can also be the greatest like mercy in the world. So my question is kind of, um, Emily, how do you think of sky as landscape and how does that inform A, the way you experience art, but maybe also the way you want me, the participant in your art to experience it? Yeah, um, thanks so much for that lead in. So I, started out kind of as a landscape painter and kind of evolved into a plein air painter, which I'm enjoying reading about in The Painter. <laughs> um, and I just, I was moving around a lot. I mentioned I, my husband's in the military, so we are just moving around a lot. There's a lot of starting over, a lot of going places. Um, 
And I just started to feel like it was kind of hard to root myself in a landscape when you're moving around that much. It's hard. It takes time to get to know a place and where you're at and just all of those different sensory elements that go into um, getting to know somewhere. And so I started to look at the sky as this place that the sky as a landscape or the sky is a place that, um, you know, offers this sense of both change in that it's, it can be ruthless and relenting. It, it can be calm and peaceful. It can be all these different things from day to day, but it also is very predictable and comforting in that it's always there. You can look up any place you're at and you're going to have, um, this experience of the sky, the sun rises every day, the sun sets every day. And so I find a lot of comfort in that kind of, um, in that paradox of that predictability and also that sense of um, shifting and change. Um, so that's kind of how I came to landscape and how I kind of see, or came to skyscapes and sky painting. And that's kind of how I see it operating um, in my work as this like kind of back, as this sense of place or this sense of landscape in and of itself. So, yeah, and I know that you, Definitely, you, Peter, use that um, throughout your work as well. So, yeah, when I was kind of prepping this idea, I was thinking, I'm like, at one point in in the river, Peter, you talk about the sky scraping across the top of trees, um, and the sky just informs so much of dog stars. If we have these plane trips, um, yeah. So I don't I don't have a more formalized question apart from how is sky informing maybe your 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 sense of landscape as well if i could jump in just really quickly one one more thing so um i'm originally from ohio and so i i guess i'll just say too that there is definitely a different quality to the sky out west too so i think that that's maybe part of how it ties into your books too as far as this colorado landscape like the I honestly didn't really start painting the sky or noticing the sky until I moved out here. Um, it has definitely a much different quality than um, in the Midwest or other parts of the country. And especially, and I mean, even in the summer too, you know, afternoon storms rolling in and it just, there is also a different quality of it out here that I think probably ties into how you're thinking about place in, in the context of the West or more specifically Colorado. Yeah, thanks for that. Because I, I was, I was one thing I was going to say was that you know I grew up in the Northeast and um, I spent a lot of time. I spent a lot of my life in Northern New England, where the sky, the sky is much more circumscribed, as you say. I mean, you know, you're in, you're in wooded hills and there's overcast a lot of the time, and um, you know the the big views are usually pretty limited um, mm -hmm. unless you climb a mountain, and so. Um, I find when I get there, you know, I, I, I love the hardwoods of northern New England and stuff, but um, I get sleepy when I'm in. <laughs> yep. And as soon as I fly into DIA in Denver and I get out, and I'm even at passenger pickup, but I, got, I have a view out to the Continental Divide, all of a sudden, you know, my heart, my chest just opens and my heart, all of a sudden I feel energized and I have this feeling like anything's possible. And it has to do with that that huge open vista and the, you know, all the sky that I can see. And one thing that struck me when I first came out here as, uh, as a very young man was um, the weather that, you know, that you could look at a um, huge chunk of sky and there would be five kinds of weather going on at the same time. You know, you'd have, you'd have, um, Virgo, which is as described in the painter, you know, you'd have, you know, these veils of rain that aren't reaching the ground over here. And over here, you might have a, a section of the divide or, or mountains that are shrouded in some kind of storm, rain or snow. And then, you know, just over here it might just be, you know, um, sunny, you know, um, plains. And uh, so I just, I just love that. I loved how, you, you know, there was so much weather going on. It was so dynamic. And that feeling also that you get when you stand on the shore and, you know, look out at the Pacific, you know, like, like Cortez, uh, that feeling of, you know, endless possibility you get. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, you know, as a writer, I am absolutely certain that if I had stayed in New England, I would not have had literally the, the, the literal perspective, which translates to me into sort of a, you know, an emotional perspective. I would not have had the perspective I needed 
to, and that has to do with that, you know, that view of the sky, I would not have had it. Um, and I would not have found the voices that I found, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm certain, you know, I, I would have felt more constricted as an artist. So good. Yeah, good point. Okay, and I really have one other kind of major like philosophical type question, and that is, um, I think I, one of the compelling pieces of a lot of your work for me is uh, there's a, a robust kind of language around grief and loss. And uh, when I was prepping for this interview, I was thinking that I'm kind of pitting two books against each other, which makes for a complicated interview, but I think with the dog stars, you have so much loss saturated in the book, so much past loss that just permeates almost every conversation in the book. And, and there's a future loss of like, of the world, of the dog, of um, relationships. There's, there's, there's a looming threat that I don't know if Grief is the perfect word for, but it it feels it feels like there's a kind of grief coming, like a train. And I felt that same tension of um, looking forward to a kind of grief in the river, um, the world on fire, being this like pending grief we're we're on a track moving towards. And there's this other component of rearview grief, where our main characters are saturated in loss of family members and i i am wondering about um grief as integral to your work what um how do you think of grief as informing your characters but maybe as your also as informing your greater body of work uh i can't get away from it you know i think i, I I thought about why I return again and again to certain authors. And it struck me that author, their work um, are like mountain springs. And each one tastes a little different, looks a little different, has a certain quality of color and clarity and maybe um, certain amount of sediment or bitterness or sweetness. And, you know, for instance, like, um, Murakami, you know, he's one of my favorite novelists, the great Japanese novelist. And, uh, you know, I, I don't care what he writes about. I really don't. I mean, I'll go anywhere with this guy. And I just love the taste of his, you know, of that spring water. And um, I don't care if it's a short story or if, it, if the book is too long. <laughs> um, I love it. And, and I think, you know, my mountain spring for some reason um, bubbles up and is informed by um, it has a taste always of loss mm -hmm. and I don't know why that is um, you know who knows you know I mean I, I, but but it's always there and I and always as I go deep deeply you know as a writer as I sort of get in touch with you know the emotional um, animus of any of any work you know whenever I whenever I get to the heart of it there's always some powerful loss and you know as you, you know and, and, and you know as a read you're you know really good reader and you know it's, it's in everything mm -hmm. and even even the stuff that's funny um, so yeah who knows who knows why but there's I find a lot of power in it as an artist whenever I touch it yeah, I, as a reader, I experience that uh, kind of like almost static, like static electricity throughout all, all of your work. I, I'm grateful for it. I feel like it's helped me articulate a language of grief in my own life that's felt around me, but often not explicit. Even if there was an explicit moment that generated the grief, I, I wouldn't name that it without your work, I don't know that I'd be able to articulate that it's kind of all around, even in the comedy. Right, and that, you know, I'm very interested in the juxtaposition of loss and grief with beauty, with joy, with humor. And, you know, I think it's really important. I mean, when I was writing The Dog Stars, you know, I started out, as I said, I sat down, I wrote the first line, 
I kept going. I started, you know, here's my first novel. You know, I've, I've, I have nine months. I think I've saved up enough. I, if I write a novel in nine months, you know, uh, and a couple of pages in, I realized this was a post-apocalyptic novel. This guy had, you know, lost everything. You know, his wife was pregnant with their first child. He's got his old dog. He's got an airplane. And I went, crap, I don't want to write a post-apocalyptic novel. This is my big chance to write fiction. I want to write, you know, literary fiction, right? Not genre fiction. And I thought the other thing is that if this ever gets published, it'll get compared to The Road and Cormac McCarthy. And as a debut novelist, you know, you do not want to get compared to Cormac McCarthy. You know, it's like <laughs> not a good idea, right? So, uh, but, but the voice of Hig was so compelling. And I found that he had a, this certain... You know, it wasn't like the road. It was a very, 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 very different feeling. And uh, Hig had this certain irrepressible joy of life, this Shwadavi that, you know, he, you know, no matter what, he'd lost everything, but he, but he still had that. He had a quirky sense of humor and, uh, you know, and it, and, it, and it kept me going. I thought, this really is different than the road. And so I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna keep writing it. And so I really am very interested in how, you know, how loss and grief inform our lives, but also how they somehow enable joy mm -hmm. and humor. And without it, and I think that's explicitly expressed in the river, uh, and I might read that paragraph later, but without it, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have the, the, the highs of the, you know, the joys and the, the delight that we have in our lives, I'm certain. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. yeah, I, uh, um... For our project, we with our with our fellows, we work a lot with Ross Gay's poetry, who so inclined to this same thing. But uh, I think in in prepping for some of this, I've been just brought back to Ross Gay's catalog of unabashed gratitude, where he he ends that poem with like a kind of forecasting child who says like this is all gonna end and it's gonna be way worse than you think. And Ross Gay says, like, no, duh. Then what do you think all this singing and shouting and dancing is about other than the fact that it's all going to go away? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I find that same kind of, um, like I said, that forecasting and rear view play at work in, in, in all of your work. I was moved by it from the first lines in the river. Um, and uh, as I come back to the dog star, I move, if dog stars, I move in that way as well. So I'll just say, I'm just grateful for the way you've put out a lot of complicated language around grief and love and joy. Thank you. And I think the like paradox of those things too. I, I love that, especially in the dog stars, there's this idea that they can, also exists simultaneously like it can, it can be this like both and situation like he can you know experience this you know feel this loss you know kind of like you were saying same just revolving around him all the time and also feel these you know moments of beauty of you know flying and fly fishing and being outside and being with his dog and um and I just love the idea of that the both and and those paradoxes and how you present those throughout your work thank you I am not a pheasant <laughs> <laughs> do you, um and then uh, my final question for the grief space is when you lose a character or a character when you get get frankly get rid of a character when wind dies when our dog dies um does that sit with you in a certain way as a reader i get crushed by it Oh, my God. oh gosh, you know, I was right. So I, like I said, you know, I just listened to Hig, you know, and I was just writing along. And when, when that happened, um, you know, I just started, I was sobbing. I mean, I had tears hitting the table in the coffee shop and I was sobbing. I know everyone in the coffee shop was just thinking that poor son of a bitch, you know, is <laughs> going through a bad divorce or, you know, just lost his mom or something, you know? And what, it, what was really going on was I was just being more thrilled than I'd ever been in my life, you know, because I was so, it was almost like I was, had, had transmigrated, you know, into another life. Um, it was so real to me. And Jasper, the dog in the Dog Stars lives with me in my heart, um, just as 
the most beloved, you know, um, animal that I've ever had, you know, lived with, um, which is so crazy and strange and wonderful, you know. Mm -hmm. It's the same with my characters, you know. I, I mean, when is based on, um, I mean, there's a few, couple of origin stories in the river, which are interesting, but one of them is my relationship with this guy, Jay Mead, who I met on the first day at college on an orientation trip, which is I wrote about in the river. There's these two guys, they show up for this orientation trip. It's the first day of this college in Northern New England. And they're on a backpacking trip through the White Mountains. And they just meet and immediately engage and talk about art and, and books and fishing. And they're so excited uh, to talk about all this stuff that they kind of just ramble out ahead of the head of the group by miles, you know, in the White Mountains, because they're both outdoors, outdoorsmen. And, you know, that was a true story. I just wrote, I wrote it as it happened. <laughs> <laughs> and my friend Jay is, uh, you know, a gentle giant. He is a, an ephemeral artist. Uh, he sort of um, he's just the sweetest person on the planet and also a, a consummate outdoors person, you know, re really tough. And uh, so I, you know, in some ways the river was uh, sort of just a song of praise, you know, of love, you know, for this friendship and this friend. And so when, when, you know, when this happens in the book and uh, there's this sudden tragedy, you know, I, I was just devastated. I mean, I didn't know that was going to happen. And, uh, you know, I, I was just crying, you know. And, and, um, so uh, it is interesting how fiction is, you know. I mean, it really does. For me, it's just, you know, all the books I've written live as memor as real memory, <laughs> which is really bizarre. <laughs> And I, you know, I don't think I'm psychotic. <laughs> um, Peter, I wanted to ask you, touching on some of the topics you just talked about, um, in reading The River, you know, you have these two characters with very different backgrounds and they, they meet in kind of a similar set of circumstances and then embark on this journey together. And initially, um, it seems like the differences between them aren't too significant. Um, but as the story goes on and the tension builds, they drift further and further apart. And it, I feel like I read the book almost as their two ideologies that they represent in conversation with each other. Um, and I think you're careful throughout the book not to give more weight to one character's way of viewing the world than the other. Um, I think there's a tone of respect both for Wynne's kind of optimistic, um, good-heartedness about the world, and then also respect for Jack's um, just sharpness and his eye for danger. Um, and I think they're kind of balanced until the end of the book, and then one of them dies and one of them lives. And I wonder if that is representative of the philosophy you hold about the world or something that you were trying to tell to readers or if it's just the way that the story panned out that kind of the naive one gets killed and the one who's always on the lookout for danger survives at the end of the day. Well, you know, given my method, you know, it, it just is the way that it, it sort of panned out. But, you know, thinking about it, you know, I've had um, emails from readers, you know, it's sort of like, why did, why did you have to kill this guy, you know, I love the book, but, you know, I'm devastated. And, and I think about it later, you know, in retrospect, I mean, there's so much work that goes on unconsciously, right, or subconsciously, and in your sleep, you know, as a, as an author. And um, so I think that there's, you know, there is a lot of sort of intent, and there's a lot of story shaping, and um, uh, character sort of character engineering and design, you know, in terms of how characters interact. I think there's a lot of that that's going on under the surface that I'm not aware of just because I've, I've written so many stories and I've read so many stories. And um, so, uh, but um, in retrospect, you know, I th and so I think about it when, you know, when readers ask me, you know, why, why did I have to do that? I look in retrospect and I think, well, because you, the story would not, the river would not live in your heart the way it does. It would not have thrown the kind of relief um, 
uh, the, it would not have it would not have highlighted the kind of conflict between um, the sort of guileless, innocent, um, you know, good, um, optimistic view of the world versus the wary, skeptical. You know, you might say the Democrat versus the Republican. <laughs> um, you know, you would not be thinking about that, and you would not be thinking of character as fate. Like, was it? Was it, was it Jack's wariness and, and distrust of the Texans that drove the story towards that death? Was it Wynn's gullibility and you know, optimism and trust of people that drove you know, that tragedy? Um, you wouldn't be thinking about that stuff if, if, if they'd both lived. Mm -hmm. And so I think it was a good, I think it was a good um, literary choice, but you know, I, I didn't feel like I meant to do it, you know. I, I was I was shocked and surprised, and and as I said, devastated. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Right. Um, I'm also interested in your work compared with um, our last interview that we did was with Amy Mizuki Matato, um, and centered around her recent book World of Wonders, um, which is also nature writing, but the way that she conceptualizes nature is just very different from how you write about the natural world. Um, uh, different focuses, different scopes for sure, but I feel like the way that she presents the world and the intention is like get outside, the world is a kind place and like go explore and notice these wonderful details. Um, your landscapes are beautiful but they're also trying to kill the characters at every turn um, and so I think I'm just intrigued by this idea of how do you love something that is dangerous something that is trying to kill you and what is that relationship like and how does that how does that kind of broad um, encompassing of both the beauty and the terror of nature how does that inform your work well <laughs> <laughs> I came up, you know, most of my life as a as a whitewater kayak ex expeditioner, and um, one thing I loved about, uh, you know, running rivers, um, as I said, is that you know it takes, you know, you get and it, it, a river is like a narrative, you know, you put on, you get on this current, and the and the current, um, the story takes you into uh, a terrain that that you've you've never um, been in before and, it, and, and you're exploring and it's wild and new. And um, I, I really loved about that about running rivers. The other thing I loved about running rivers is how when you're running, you know, demanding whitewater um, that has, you know, where the stakes are very high and it can, and it can kill people, um, how it demands the best of yourself. And it demands um, your utmost discipline and it demands uh, your generosity, um, you know, in terms of, you know, taking care of other people who are, you know, on your team. And it, um, so uh, I loved how it, you know, those kind of challenges, you know, sort of brought out your best or, you know, it could in some circumstances bring out people's worst. And I love how you know, as a writer going along on these expeditions, as a magazine writer on a lot of these trips, uh, I love to observe, you know, character under pressure. And, you know, as you said, you know, people start out sort of feeling sort of similar and feeling, you know, sort of like there, there's no great, you know, differences between people. Everyone's got the same sort of intention to, to run this river, to be in this place. And to, but, but as the pressure builds, you know, uh, it sharpens the differences and it sharpens the different postures and how people approach their lives. And, and I just love that. I also grew up loving Westerns and I grew up in New York City, but I read, by the time I was like 15, I had read every Louis L'Amour pulp Western that, he, you know, there were, there were like a hundred of them. And I'd watched every, you know, classic Western movie and dreamed of the West. And one thing I really, um, you know, as I, as I thought about it later, one thing I just adore about Westerns is that the landscape and the wildness is a character and maybe the major character. Mm -hmm. And that all the drama of, of the people involved, the, the characters that are the, the, the little ones are, are, all that drama is, is happening, you know, with this 
against this backdrop of something much greater, which is God. And, you know, um, however, you know, you can seem of God, but it sort of, it stands as this great power that's unpredictable. Um, and uh, as, as, you know, you said in the beginning, Sam, you know, merciful and ruthless and heedless and wild and, you know, and I, and I just love that. So um, for me, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, there is a different feeling when you go into wild country, say, to go fishing and you're all alone in a drainage and the sun's going down and, you know, you've already seen one bear run up through the woods and, you know, you can hear the knock of maybe elk, an elk antler and, you know, and it's just, and you're all alone and, um, you know, you're wading up, a, up through a current, you could slip, you could encounter an a lion you could do and you know there's something that brings me much more alive than say if I was fishing uh, a farm trout pond you know in a beautiful uh, you know dude ranch mm -hmm. there's a different part of me that comes alive and that becomes um, that tunes in and that you know and it starts to demand the best of myself and I just love that feeling and so uh, I guess I like writing about, um, you know, characters being in a place that demands uh, that they bring the best of themselves. Okay, with the last chunk, I'm wondering if you'll just read an excerpt or two from the river. That's the book we're going to be sending out next month to our book club subscribers. Um, I am generally, um, I'm kind of hoping you'll pick the sections that kind of animate that feel animating to you. Um, and, and we'll just include that kind of as a little video excerpt in a reading guide that people get uh, with their book box. Sure, I thought, you know, I, I thought I'd just start um, with five minutes from the beginning, the first page, because that's always the most exciting for me sometimes, you know, as a writer. Um, and uh, it'll save readers some time. <laughs> 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 so the river prologue they had been smelling smoke for two days at first they thought it was another campfire and that surprised them because they had not heard the engine of a plane and they'd been traveling the string of long lakes for days and had not seen sign of another person or even the distant movement of another canoe the only tracks in the mud of the portages were wolf and moose otter, bear. The winds were west and north and they were moving north. So if it was another party, they were ahead of them. It perplexed them because they were smelling smoke, not only in early morning and at night, but would catch themselves at odd hours, lifting their noses like coyotes, nostrils flaring. And then one evening they pulled up on a wooded island and they made camp and fried a meal of lake trout on a driftwood fire and watched the sun sink into the spruce on the far shore. Late August, a clear night becoming cold. There was no aurora borealis, just the dense sparks of the stars blown from their own ancient fire. They climbed the hill. They did not need a headlamp as they were used to moving in the dark. Sometimes if they were feeling strong, they paddled half the night. They loved how the darkness amplified the sounds, the gulp of the dipping paddles, the knock of the wood shaft against the gunwale, the long, desolate cry of a loon. The loons especially, how they hollowed out the night with longing. Tonight there was no loon and almost no wind and they went up through tamarack and hemlock and a few large birch trees whose pale bark fluoresced. At the top of the knoll, they followed a game trail to a ledge of broken rock as if they weren't the first who had sought the view. And they saw it. They looked northwest. At first, they thought it was the sun, but it was far too late for any lingering sunset. There were no cities in that direction for a thousand miles. In the farthest distance over the trees was an orange glow. It lay on the horizon like the light from banked embers and it fluttered barely so they wondered if it was their eyes and they knew it was a fire. 
a forest fire, who knew how far off or how big, but bigger than any they could imagine. It seemed to spread over two quadrants and they didn't say a word, but the silence of it and the way it seemed to breathe scared them to the bone. The prevailing wind would push the blaze right to them. At the pace they were going, they were at least two weeks from the Cree village of Wapak and Hudson Bay. When the most northerly lake spilled into the river, they would pick up speed, but there was no way to shorten the miles. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, write, read two more pages from the opening. So continuing, on the morning after seeing the fire, they did, they did spot another camp. It was on the northeastern verge of a wooded island and they swung out to it and were surprised that no one was breaking down the large wall tent. No one was going anywhere. There was an old white painted square stern wood strip canoe on the gravel with a trolling motor clamped to the transom and two men in folding lawn chairs, legs sprawled straight. Jack and Wynne beached and hailed them and the men lifted their arms. They had a plastic fifth of ancient age bourbon on the stones between the chairs. The heavier one, by the way, H and H with uh, grapefruit sodas is a great drink. <laughs> the heavier one wore a flannel shirt and square steel rimmed tinted glasses. The skinny one a Texans cap. Two spinning rods and a Winchester Model 70 bolt action rifle leaned against a pine. Jack said, "Y'all see the fire?" The skinny one said, "Y'all see any pretty girls?" G-rated version. Uh, the men burst out laughing. They were drunk. Jack felt disgust, but being drunk on a summer morning didn't deserve a death sentence. Jack said, there's a fire, big ass fire to the Northwest, what you've been smelling the last few days. Wynn said, you guys have a satellite phone? That set them off again. When they were finished laughing, the heavy one said, you two need to chillax. Why don't you pull up a chair? There were no extra chairs. He lifted the bourbon by the neck between two fingers and rocked it toward them. Jack held up a hand and the man shrugged and brought the fifth up, watching its progress intently as though he was operating a crane. The lake was a narrow reach. And if the fire overran the Western shore, this island would not keep the men safe. How have you been making the portages, Jack said. He meant the carries between the lakes. We got the wheelie thing, the skinny man said. He made a sweeping gesture at the camp. We got just about everything, the fat man said. Except women, the two let out another gust of laughter. Jack said, the fire's up wind there. We figure maybe 30 miles off, it's a killer. The fat man brought them into focus. His face turned serious. We got it covered, he said, do you? It's all copacetic here. Why don't you have a drink? He gestured at Wynn. You, the big one. What's your name? Wynn? He's the mean one, huh? Fat man cocked his head at Jack. What's his name? Go home? Win or go home? Ha! Wynn didn't know what to say. Jack looked at them. He said, well, you might get to high ground and take a look that away one evening. He pointed across the lake. He didn't think either of them would climb a hill or a tree. He waved, wished them luck without conviction, and he and Wynn got in their canoe and left. So that's the, that's the opening section. Um, did you wanna, wanna hear one other two page section or? Uh, yeah, that would be great. Okay, so um, in the book, uh, they, they go and they make a camp after meeting the Texans on an island. and. Um, this is like uh, two days later and they wake up and a few things are very concerning. One is that there's a um, very thick fog coupled with uh, a terribly fierce wind. And they, they've never experienced that as canoers. You know, always when there was thick fog, it was very still. Uh, so this really weird uh, combination of wind and fog uh, felt menacing. The other thing was there was frost, a thick frost, and they hadn't expected that at this time, you know, just into late August. They planned the trip 
so that they could sort of beat the cold weather. And they had read histories of expeditions that had been up in the great north that had been overtaken by early winter and, and men had died. And so um, that was a concern that this was coming early. The third thing was, as they paddled away um, and then uh, paddled close to the shore because the waves were so fierce and they were kind of lapping you know, up against the canoe and they, they were afraid of a capsize, so they figured they'd paddle close to shore in case that happened. Um, they, they heard in the fog, in the wind, what sounded like a couple arguing um, and arguing rather vigorously. And they kind of look at each other as they're paddling, you know, should we stop and tell them about the fire that we saw? Um, and then they sort of decide, just sort of um, spontaneously through their through the glance, they decide, now nah, we'll keep, you know, if they if you can expect privacy in your home, you should expect privacy out here in the middle of nowhere. Plus, it's going to be dangerous landing the boat in these heavy waves on this broken limestone. So they keep going. But then a couple hours later, the wind drops and the fog clears and they figure, you know, really the right thing to do is to go back and tell this couple about this fire because they may not know it's coming. And so they paddle back uh, and they burn, you know, they figure they're going to burn half a day doing it. Uh, and they get along the shore and they don't see any camp and they don't see any couple. And it's really weird. And so <clears throat> I'm just going to read this page as, as they're searching. Now with the big fog lifted and the air lens clear and cold, they thought they'd have no problem spotting the couple's camp, but they couldn't. It occurred to them that maybe there'd been more than two, two people. Maybe it had been an entire expedition camped on the East shore and they, all they'd heard was the shouting of the couple down on the beach. Maybe the man and the woman had walked away from the group to argue, but then it would have been easier to spot the colorful tents of this other party or to see the string of canoes making their way north to the lake's outlet and the true river, but they didn't. They didn't see a thing. They saw the patches of bright fireweed and the wall of woods and shallow bays with stony beaches, sometimes backed by fringes of tall, tawny grass. They saw rocky coves with deadfall spruce lying across black boulders and bleached like bones and low patches of vegetation between the rocks and the shore that they knew were low bush blueberries. Um, and then on a pair of, so, so they keep going and they decide, okay, well, let's just stop, pull over and make tea. Um, that's what they do. <laughs> and we'll make a fire, make some tea and we'll think about some things. So here they are. A pair of mergansers winged into the field of wind's glasses. They do that and wind, wind is out in the water um, scanning with binoculars. Into the field of wind's glasses and out of it beating fast southward. He scanned east and caught a big raptor circling. He followed it and it flashed white and he was sure it was a bald eagle hunting. But no canoe. Wind gave up and Jack knew what he was going to do next and he did. He set the binox on the rocks where they wouldn't dangle off his neck and then he squatted and began prospecting for stones up and down the beach. He gathered arm loads, not just rocks but sticks, two feathers, probably osprey and crow, and he knelt and stacked the stones into two piles, less like cairns than funeral mounds, and channeled the water around them and lay the feathers in the channels like boats. Long boats, he muttered to himself, but Jack heard him, like a Viking funeral. If Jack hummed, Wynne talked to himself, especially while making his thin thingamajigs, what Jack called them. Wynne was crazy about Goldsworthy, the environmental sculptor, and he was in awe of the ethic of ephemeral art from Buddhist sand painting to the sapling moons of J. Mead, the untethering of ego, the purity of creating something that wouldn't even be around to sign in a matter of hours or days, what that said about ownership and the impermanence of all things. He was less impressed with the extravagant shroudings of Christo, which he thought were grandiose and domineering. Squatting there at water's edge, Wynne reminded Jack of a little kid at the beach with a bucket and pail. He was just as absorbed and happy. Aren't you even gonna take a picture? Wynne looked up, shrugged. He had a goofy smile like someone caught in the act of talking seriously to a chipmunk. Jack started a fire 
It popped and blazed, and he dipped the kettle and arranged two flat rocks beside the flames. And with a stick, he raked coals and burning sticks into the gap over which he placed the pot. The water boiled fast, and he flipped up the wire handle with his stick and lifted it onto one of the rocks and went to the canoe and dug tea and brown sugar from a plastic box they used as a day bag. He dropped a tea bag into the kettle and sat on a smooth log in the bright sun and watched the lake. There is no place I'd rather be, he thought. And also, something is not right. Thank you. <laughs> really beautiful. Just grateful for that and for your time this morning. Um, this is a thrill for us. So thanks for- thanks. Wonderful to be with you all. And um, I wish you so much luck with the projects. And right after uh, we get off, um, would you please send me a link to Emily's paintings? I will be great all yeah. right hey, thanks for joining us thanks for letting me put you on the spot a little bit thank you so oh, much great love it love it love it all right you all have a great day thanks you too thank you bye